Well, this is the question that we're asking. Every one of us today and throughout these weeks ahead, are you, are you in? Are you all in? I hope that you won't miss a week. I'm speaking now to the entire church family over these next five weeks or so and our friends in the chapel right now, Sanctuary, the Great Hall later on. Uh, in Espanol, Rolando will be taking the lead. But today's a great day and I'm so glad that you're here. If you wanna grab your Bible, we're gonna be in the book of Acts. Ultimately, we'll get there. I want everybody in the word today. Hey, don't miss a Sunday for the next five weeks. We're going to be, I think, a, a really a historic time in the life of our church. We're going to be asking questions every week that will align with unique distinctives about our church, and we're going to have the opportunity to say, I'm, I'm all in. Um, in fact, today, you've received a bulletin, I hope, coming in, because every week, you're going to need, need one. There's a perforated piece here that asks the question today, how will you follow Jesus? So have this out. Uh, and keep it with you. You can write on it during the sermon as the Spirit speaks to you, and you can hang on to it. You can put it in your journal or in your Bible, and it's all going to land on October the 22nd. We're going to celebrate our 84th anniversary uh, all together. Gang, mark your calendar, bring friends. We're going to all be together in the sanctuary. We're going to pack the house. Men of Nehemiah are going to be here to lead, help lead us in worship. We're going to spill out after that. Um, onto the lawn. We're going to take a picture in the sanctuary together. We're going to mark this historic moment. On that day, in fact, we'll be dreaming, talking about, even dreaming about what our campus might look like. Who would have ever dreamed, right, that many years ago when they were breaking ground on this piece of land, what this whole area would look like around here and what the church would ultimately look like and what would we we'd be doing? Uh, but we've noted that the best way, at least for now, for me to give a downbeat to the entire church family in, in a multi venue multi-generational, uh, multi-language, multi-ethnic church uh, is to come uh, here on, online and, and through, uh, through our media here. We're so grateful for our team who helps make uh, this happen. I'm curious. Uh, I want to I ask you, raise your hand. Um, everybody can, can see how many of you have joined the church in the past 15 years. Some of y'all have to do a little math right around the 15 year mark. Yeah. So many of you, we've had over that period of time, 4,500 people join our church, 4,500 people and 1,200, I think it is maybe 1,400 people have been baptized over that period of time. Today, we're going to continue uh, to, to not only just add to that number, but every soul that is saved, these are believers who've been baptized. Sure enough, 1,400 believers over that period of time. And long before we got here, uh, we saw it, that, that there were those who've come before us. And what we're going to do in these days to, is to imagine the next five years, 10, 15 years, and beyond. We're going to talk about how Christ centers us. And today, we're going to focus on that. We're going to talk about how, how scripture guides us. These are, these are distinctives about our church. If you want to know more about us, if you're a guest, these are great weeks to be here. We're going to talk about how cultural engagement propels us, how serving defines us, and how God's glory drives us in everything that we do. In fact, Ephesians 3.20, you saw it a moment ago, uh, will be our guiding verse. A couple of verses we're going to memorize together. In fact, let's say them together. Uh, out loud and proclaim this together. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or think according to the work at, yeah, power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen and amen. All to his glory. We do everything for him. I hope if you're a guest, you've already figured this out, that uh, we're all about Jesus. He centers us is what I want to talk about today. And uh, what does that look like? What does that mean? You know, we live in the most distracted time, maybe in the history of the world, particularly here in the modern West. Many of you are feeling distracted. I know a lot of us have this guiding, uh, nagging sense that we really need to simplify our lives. I was with our residents this past week as we gathered together and we talked about uh, simplicity, reading together Richard Foster's book, The Celebration of Discipline. And we talked about how simplicity is a byproduct of focus, right? Think of a laser. A laser is able to condense light so much so 
It emits light so condensed that it can actually be so condensed that it can cut through steel. That's the power of focus. Here it is. Where focus goes, where focus goes, energy flows. Where your focus goes is where your energy flows. Jesus said it like this. Wherever your heart will be or is, wherever your heart is, that's where, that's where your energy, your life will run, right? Whatever you treasure, that's where your heart will go. He says, whatever you treasure, and we all treasure something. Whatever you worship, whatever your focus is, is going to bring all of your attention, your time, your, we, we've said it before, your, your anxieties, whatever you worry about, whatever you get hyped about, whatever you get angry about, will point you to your idols. And what many of us need is, is a laser focus on the main thing. Jesus didn't talk about balance. We've talked about this. Uh, he talked about an all-out pursuit of one thing. He said it this way in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, all this stuff of life will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom, and everything else will find its rightful place. The many, for many of us today, the problem in your life, often in my life, is that we're not focused. So if you have all the priorities of life, uh, you have no priority. And everything else, everybody else is driving your life. We are all about Jesus. And we're reading through the book of Acts together. So turn to the book of Acts again if you're not there yet. Grab your dwell reading a card. Okay, we're, gonna, we're already in. We're, we're reading. We've been reading the text that we're going to look at today, this past week. Last week, gang, our first graders got their Bibles. It was a big day. Uh, so they're now reading. Yeah, they're diving in, parents guiding them. And what we're going to see today in the passage we're going to look at, ultimately going to get to Acts 2. I'm going to set it up here. Um, we're going to see that Jesus saves us. He, he centers us and he sends us. All right. So here in the first part of the book of Acts chapter one, post-resurrection. So early on in the story of Jesus, uh, so early, the spirit hasn't come yet. Okay. So in verse four, uh, staying with him, he, he says, Hey, don't, don't depart Jerusalem because you're going to wait for the promise of the spirit to come, which he had promised as well. He says, hey, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he says, not too many days from now. Now think about this in context. Jesus was, before he ascended, he was, after the resurrection, he was 40 days. Um, we're getting to Pentecost, okay, which literally means 50. So 50 days after the Passover, okay, for them was Pentecost. We know that it's 50 days then after the crucifixion, after the resurrection. We're talking about like 10 days later, okay, the spirit is going to come. And so he says all this. He says the spirit's going to come. And then they ask him, hey, is this when you're going to, you know, is this when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this when it's going to happen? Because they believed in a militaristic kind of a political leader who's going to come with power and take out the Romans. And when is it going to happen? Let's go. Not only is this a misguided nationalism. This is a misunderstanding of the kingdom. It's not going to come through worldly power. It's going to come through the power of the spirit, Christ in us, his spirit, the Holy Spirit in us to live lives that are transformative and that love the world and draw people to him. He's, so he doesn't even answer the question. It's so far off. He says something much bigger is going on here. And this is where we read Acts 1.8 a passage that we all know well around here. And if you're a guest, we love this passage. Let's read it together. Let's read this one together. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So these are not only concentric circles, they are that, geographical concentric circles. He's saying the gospel's going to go from here. Now, why Jerusalem? That's where they were, right? But not only that, he's saying the gospel is going to transform your life so much, it's going to send you out, not just among people who look like you, think like you, act like you, dress like you, vote like you. It's going to send you out into Judea to places all around where people don't look like you. They don't think like you. Uh, you. You may struggle with what they're all about. Then it's going to send you even further to Samaria, to places where people don't even like you. And watch this, where you have preconceived ideas about people who have different takes on life. They don't vote like you. They don't think like you. They don't believe like you. 
They're very different. And then he says, you're going to go all the way to the ends of the earth. And by the way, in this context, in this particular passage, we are the ends of the earth, right? Like we, we're the ones so far out there as we look at our church history and see where we are now. We're not at the center of it all. We're ones who have come late to the game in some ways. But the gospel always has, here's the point, a centrifugal force. It's always leading us out, always pointing us out to others. Even today, it it challenges you to reach out to people, to love someone well, to walk across the room. And it starts with us right here, right now. So in Acts 2, all that to set this up. They're at the day of Pentecost. This is ground zero of the invasion of God's spirit and his grace that's come into the world. And here we see a passage that many of you know, where 120 people have gathered. We're going to look at the beginning of the church. The church started in a prayer meeting, and we see that the Spirit falls upon the people. This is a crazy story, the beginning part of Acts. All the known world, really different languages, people from all over are there for this big uh, festival. Verse 12 of chapter 2, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? This is the key question that sets up the rest of the chapter. What is happening? What is going on right here? But others were mocking and and said, hey, they're filled with new wine. So the question, what is this? Sets up the entire sermon. If you understand, that's what then Peter, his sermon here, first three-point sermon, by the way, ever. That's where it all started. Um, Where where he preaches this sermon uh, in response to that question. Okay, so he's going to say, well, I'll tell you what this is. And he'll do so in an incredible way, as we'll see here in a moment. But Peter, verse 14, standing with the 11, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. He's saying, listen up, listen up, come on, focus, listen up, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since they're all Baptists and they are here to, to listen. <laughs> no, he didn't, he didn't say that. They weren't Baptists. Um, there, no, he says it's nine o'clock in the morning. I mean, not even Episcopalians don't drink, you know, that year early. So then Peter brings the message that is in response to the question, what, what is this? What is this? And the response is brilliant. It's like a, a brilliant apologetic where, where he is giving a defense that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, which means liberating king. He's the one we've been looking for. And, it's, and, and, he, and he draws from Old Testament passages. Now take note, please. He, 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 he comes at them with their own authority and he appeals to their intellect. All right, teaching us how to engage culture. He says, let's talk about this because you all, here's what I see. Here's what you believe. This is your authority. So he draw all three points, if you will, of his sermon are drawn from Old Testament passages. I mean, just brilliant to say, Jesus saves. He, he centers our lives and he sends us out. First, Jesus saves, okay? Throughout his message, he's saying this is that. Look at this. He goes to Joel first. He goes to a prophecy of Joel in verse 16. But this, okay, this is that. This that you're seeing is what what Joel talked about, okay, uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and young men shall see visions. Old men shall dream dreams. They shall imagine what God is up to, even on my male servants and female servants, take note, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy, okay? So Christ's resurrection, okay, his perfect life lived, fulfilling the law, his death and resurrection sparks now a revolution, a global revolution that's fueled by the spirit. And notice men and women are filled with the spirit. Your sons and daughters are now filled with the Spirit. Jesus brings this new kingdom trajectory. This is what, he's saying, this is what's happening. Everyone now is is being changed by the gospel. And and we'll see, it goes forth to all people now. That's what's happening here. This is the return, or um, how about the, 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 the opposite of the Tower of Babel. Now clarity is coming. And the Spirit's falling equally among his people. I've said it, he doesn't genderize 
the Great Commission. He says, everybody's going to go. This is a new thing. This is a new day. And since 1939, gang, our church has been on this trajectory, empowered by the Spirit, centered on Christ. We are a Great Commission church, literally in our constitution, a Great Commission church. And we have been sent out to reach this generation and the next and the next, our sons, our daughters. And now is our time. Now is our time. And the Lord has brought you here. Even if you're a guest, not yet a member, he has brought you here at this time. And friends, again, let's don't waste your life. Let's devote ourselves to what God is doing among his people right here, right now. Look at verse 20, 21. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This, this is that. This is what's happening. For the first time ever, the gospel is being offered to all people. Christ is the center of it all because by faith, not our works, this is altogether new. We can come to him and be saved. This is the inclusive nature of the gospel we talk about. Everybody's included. Every ethnicity, every nationality, whatever your education, wherever you're from, everybody is welcome in. We said it's the most inclusive exclusivity ever known because Christ alone has made a way, not our own works. So it's, it's exclusive in that he is the only one who saves us. So Jesus saves us. Okay. Secondly, Jesus centers us. How, listen, how is the spirit speaking to you? You know, take notes, write these things down. He is the center of it all. Peter goes on. Look at verse 22. Men of Israel, Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. He said, you've seen this as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan, definite, definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up. Loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. He's saying Jesus rose from the dead. And if he did, then everything he said is true. Right? Everything. He is the source of truth. Truth proceeds from him. He's at the center. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And then he said, then he draws, watch this. He goes now to Psalm 16. Verses 8 through 11 in verse 25. Look at this. For David says, now hang with me here. Concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with presence. David spoke of one who would escape hell, whose body would not decay. And Peter says that in verse 29, you all know David died. You know where he's born. He's not talking about himself. He can't be talking about himself. And in 2 Samuel uh, verse 7, Nathan the, the, the prophet comes to Daniel and he says that his throne will be established forever. David ends up, right, he dies, he's dead, dies like the rest of us. But there's this king that would come and his kingdom would last forever. It's why in Luke chapter 1, verse 32, the Christmas story, angel says to Mary that her baby is going to be on the throne of, watch this, his father David forever. He's coming out of the Davidic line, all the prophecies pointing to him. This is Peter saying, he's the one, he's the one. Jesus is the only one who defeated death and reigns now for eternity. And the empty tomb is, is proof. This is that. And then in verse 32, then Jesus, this Jesus, God raised up. And, and of that, we are all witnesses. Again, seven weeks prior, he rose from the dead. Ten days or so earlier, Peter, the others uh, were there watching him called them out, commissioned them to go. We've all been witnesses of this, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. 
This is proof, he's saying. You can hear him just like me, just passion. He's saying, this is it. This is it. He's alive. And he promised his spirit would come. We, we saw this in John 7, verse 39. We saw it in John 14, 15, 16. We saw it in John 17. It's going to be advantageous that I leave. Wait, what? Yes, so the Spirit can come and guide you in all truth. And then in Acts 1, 8, he says, the Spirit is going to come. So what does it mean for Christ to be central to our lives? So to live a Christocentric, is how we say it. Be a Christocentric family. The way we talk about it here, and this can be applied to your own life. Think about it. And you could write down ways that you need to get focused. We talk about core versus non-core. In fact, in the very first sermon series, I think it was called Core, that I ever preached here as your pastor, I, I drew from this concept. We're going to stay focused on the core. Whenever we get off track is when we get in trouble. A little known reformer, you've probably heard something like this. He said this, in all things essential unity, in all things non-essential liberty, and in all things charity, yeah, I've said it this way. In all things core, unity. In all things non-core, there's freedom. In all things, grace. So the point is this. The core never changes. This is what we're going to be talking about in these weeks, weeks ahead. And for your own life, a life filled with distractions. See, many of us, we, we're so distracted, so busy, so anxious. Not because we're so important. Not because we, we, we're living a meaningful life necessarily. But because we're not focused. We, we need to focus on the core, and Jesus is the core. See, here's how this works. Think of concentric circles again. We have the core. We've got convictions. Okay, there's a personal conviction. The core is the gospel and, and all that is orthodox Christianity. I mean, it is the point of a spear. Outside of that, we have personal convictions, even theological convictions we might disagree on. Then, then outside of that are opinions. Outside of that are questions. We can never allow our personal convictions or preferences become core. This is what keeps the church focused. He is our focus. Christ is our focus. He is our message, not our preferences. Our methods are not core. Our methods are informed by his mission. How can we reach more people? How can we reach the next generation with the gospel? He is our focus. Christ is the core. And this is a word for some of us here today is that you would get centered instead of running, chasing after idols of possessions, of performance, of popularity or power. You see, when you get off the core, not only in the church, but in our own lives, when something non-core becomes core, uh, in theological terms, we call that heresy is what that is. When you take something that's core and you remove it as non-core, that's heresy. And this can play out in our own lives. We start to believe a false gospel, start chasing after things that do not matter. And so Peter continues to connect the prophetic dots for his audience, for us. And he goes now to Psalm 110, verse 1. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David, again, Peter's saying he's talking about someone else. Who can rightly claim to be king of the king? He's saying there's another Lord over me. And he says, if Jesus rose from the dead, if it is true and his spirit has come upon us, then everything, uh, everything is under his, his reign. He's Lord of all. Tim Keller, in his book, The Reason for God, um, the subtitle, I think, is Belief in the Age of Skepticism. He wrote this. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. Right? If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything that he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether, you, whether or not you like his teaching. But whether or not he rose from the dead. Do you believe I mean, what do we do with all this? In verse 36, let all the house of Israel, let all the house of Park City's Baptist Church, all the house of God's people, those who are hearing the message of the gospel here in Dallas, even this morning around the world, know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart 
And, and friends, mark that. They were cut to the heart until this becomes personal for you. Until you see the need for a savior, you will never turn to him. You will never be, be saved because necessity finds him out. Necessity leads us to him. This Jesus, he says, Peter goes on, the, and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? They turn to them and say, they say to him, what shall we do? They're so convicted of the heart. This Jesus, look at this, whom you crucified, until you realize that Christ died for you, that you are the one. Our sin, my sin, put him on the cross. We'll never turn to him. In verse 38, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. What do we do with this? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is it. This is that, all that we've looked for, all of life is found in Jesus. He saves, he centers us, finally he sends us. He sends us, look at verse 39. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Look at this, the promise is for your children. It's for your children's children. It's for all generations and for eight decades Our church has said we exist to lead all generations to love Jesus. And now we are white hot focused on that. For for those who are far off, those who are here in our own Jerusalem, in Dallas, in in, in South Dallas, East and West, we're here for all of Texas. We go. We go to Guatemala. We go to the Caribbean Basin. We go to India. We go to Africa. We're for the nations. Because Christ is for the nations. Look at uh, verse 40. And with many other words, he bore witness. This sermon kept going, by the way. This is a long sermon, right? And continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Anybody? From this, what has changed? What's new under the sun? Save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day. About 3,000 souls. And so it begins. Acts 1.8 is set in motion. Because Jesus brings salvation. He saves us. He centers us in a crooked generation. And he, and he helps us to know how to live our lives in these days. And then he sends us out. I'll close with this. On Wednesday, um, early in the morning, I got a text from Paul Peterson. Some of y'all know Paul and Micah. We've been praying for them um, Micah has come through um, cancer herself uh, like a champ uh, over the past couple of years. And we've been praying for them a long time. Love this family. Uh, most of you know that Pike got back, their son, 13-year-old son, got back from youth camp and then was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, while the siblings were presuming, assuming that they have this same genetic disorder, if you will, whatever it is, uh, passed on from mom. They're getting tested. And while we're waiting on all of that, we have a, we have a donor drive here and 1200 plus of you and the city, others came around the, the community came around and were swabbed to, for a match for Pike praying for a match for Pike. I get a text on Wednesday morning early. And Paul tells me that his older brother, Philip is not only a match, but a perfect match for Pike and Pike now is going to have, a, uh, have the donor, his own brother, with a, with a bone marrow transplant that will save his life, friends, will save his life. And we praise God for what's happened and how he's answered our prayers. Yes. So, so I, I'm getting this. Um, I mean, it's early. Like we're having Stace and I, we're having our little quiet time moment there. And, and uh, I'm like, oh my gosh, No. Like we've been praying, crying out for God, you know, to move. And so I call Paul like right away. I'm like, bro, are you kidding me? And so I'm, you know, I'm in tears. I'm crying, talking to him. Yes, it's happened. And y'all this, imagine him to son. Yo, it, Pike's not living without a, without a, without a transplant. He's not living and he, he's, he's dying. And he finds out that his, his own son, Philip is there and so Pike can live. Paul then, so we're rejoicing. I'm, I'm, I hear this. I'm telling everybody I know. 
Like I text my team. I'm like that throughout the day. I'm telling everybody that I know. Paul texted me back early. It's still early in the morning. He texted me back and he said, Jeff, I just told the woman who, um, who took my breakfast order that I love her. <laughs> it's like, what? Because good news does that to you, doesn't it? Everything changes. Everything changes and everybody needs to be loved. The gospel changes us because Jesus saves us. Watch this. The Bible tells us Christ came. He comes all the way down. He becomes our brother. He becomes our big brother, inviting brothers and sisters to come to have life and through a blood sacrifice. You talk about a transfusion. You talk about life, his spirit coming into us. And so I go from there and I'm just like, I, this is amazing. And so I go that morning, the next thing I'm doing, I'm at Larry Bird's house. Some of y'all know Larry is a longtime member, a mentor to many of us, so former chairman of Deacons. Um, Larry is at home now. He's doing, he's doing well. He's aware of everything. He's, he's mentally just all there, but he can't talk and he can't write. And this is a man who shared the gospel through his work, through his life in so many ways. And so I'm just with him and we're just celebrating Pike as well with family and I want to go take uh, the Lord's Supper with Larry. And I left, you know, just so encouraged because Larry's trying with all he could. He's trying to tell me how much he loved me and us. And he's all in and you can sort of understand at times and then not. And, and I left thinking, here's a man who shared the gospel like all of his life. And he's still proclaiming and still glorifying God. But he can't speak. And I left thinking, I can, I can speak. I can still speak. Friend, you can speak. We can share the good news. That's why we're here as a church, to worship the one who saved us and allow him to center our lives and then allow us to go and share the gospel. This is that. This is what he's doing in our day. And so the conclusion, Acts 2, 36, let all the house of Israel, let all of Park City's Baptist Church, everyone who's hearing my voice, therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And let's get this straight, friends. We don't ask Jesus to be Lord of our lives. You don't ask Jesus to be Lord. Or worse, you don't make him Lord. He is Lord. You simply submit to him. You agree that he's Lord. That's confession. Agree and repent that he is Lord. You acknowledge him as Lord and you bow down to him or you will never have life. and You'll be separated from him for all eternity. And in the end, what do we do? Repent and be baptized. How's the spirit speaking in your heart? We're going to baptize today. And if you want to be baptized today, I'm thinking of the Ethiopian eunuch who says, I understand. I want to be saved. And there's water. What permits me from being baptized right now? And we're ready for you. If you want to come, you can come here after the service. You can talk to others in our other venues and say, yes, count me in. Come join us out there as we celebrate the greatest moment for a church to, to, to gather around people who are saved and being baptized. And so let's do this. Let's pray together. I want to I ask you, how will you follow Jesus? Make sure you take that bulletin with you and fill it out, fill it in, and, uh, and determine how will you follow Jesus. And so, Lord, we give you our lives. We proclaim you, Lord of all. And it's time, Lord, for us just to fall down before you and say, yes, thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sin. Thank you for the spirit that you sent to us. Thank you for all you're doing. But Lord, you, we know there's much more that you desire for us to imagine in our own personal lives, together as a church, more than we can imagine because you are more than able. We pray all of this in your mighty name, amen.